sometimes unexpected things happen, right? You know, it's uh, sometimes things that we don't want to have happen, like a snowstorm on a, a day when we're getting ready here for uh, worshiping the Lord. But uh, other times, maybe something good happens. When we had launched, uh, some of you know this story, uh, we sent out uh, something to people who were members at Harvest and became members here. You didn't have to go through the whole um, process again. We made it very easy for you. And so when you did that, if you clicked on those links, I sent you a little video that talked about something that happened. And when we were transitioning this building over time, you know, we had different safes here. And um, Ken was like, there's this safe in the basement. It's sitting underneath our regular safe, but nobody knows how to get into this lower safe. Do you know how to get into this lower safe? And I was like, I have no idea. I don't know any of the combos. That thing has been here forever. I have no idea how to get into that. So I called around and I finally got in touch with Jim Rakowski, who was a deacon here. And I said, Jim, do you have Uh, the code by any chance to get into the safe. And he sends me a picture. He had it in his wallet, this little thing here. You can go ahead and you can keep all that data, whatever. I don't even know where that safe is anymore. So he had it and Ken opened up. I'm like, here it is. We're about to plant this church. I'm like, it's Geraldo Rivera and the vault. You guys know what I'm talking about? Some of you older people know what I'm talking about. It's like, I'm like, we are going to get it right here. It's going to be a million dollars in bonds in that by faith, I'm just like, ah, this is going to happen. And then he texts me a picture of a dime. All that was in that safe was a dime. <laughs> Sometimes it's unexpected. You just don't know. And that's the way life is, right? Even as you've been going through the word of God and we've been seeing Jesus interacting with people, sometimes they meet him and it's so awesome, the unexpected thing that happens. And other times, man, this doesn't sound that great. Usually for the Pharisees and the religious people, it doesn't sound so great. For the rich ruler last week, it didn't sound so great. For the, uh, for the Pharisee, And the tax collector inside this parable doesn't sound so great, but for the paralytic who gets lowered down into that house and gets healed and walks home, man, that unexpected thing sounds good. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not so good. And that's the way it is in the kingdom of God. That's the way it is in life. And today we come to a part of the scripture where something unexpected happens to somebody who it's unexpected to happen to. It's uh, one of the most famous stories. We learn it when we're children in Sunday school children's ministry. And so uh, I've called this message today, Salvation Unexpected. Salvation Unexpected. We're in Luke chapter 19. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If you don't have a Bible hand, you can open up a phone, look on a browser, download the Bible app. I'm in the English Standard Version. It just helps to follow along. And you can see this story here as we make our way through it. Luke 19, starting at verse 1, Salvation Unexpected unexpected. Let's read the whole passage first, and then we'll talk about it. He, that's Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That verse right there, as I was reading, people smarter than me who've studied it for years and years and generations, academics and scholars, have pointed out to me in my study that that right there is the theme verse of the whole Gospel of Luke. If you want to sum up the Gospel of Luke in one sentence, it is, The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's it. That's the mission of Jesus. You can sum it all up right there. See, Jesus didn't come to topple governments. Jesus didn't come to end poverty. Jesus didn't come to stop racism. Now, you're like, what are you talking about? All those things sound great, except the toppling of the government thing. All those other things, you're like, we want those things to happen. Of course we do. But that isn't the reason Jesus came. Jesus came 
Here it is, the mission. He says it himself, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That is the mission. Then if people start to get on the mission and they start to get saved, just like he starts to make things right with the poor, we start to do better things and justice starts to happen and people are treated better and there is no racism and all these things happen, but you see it is a byproduct of the main mission. People get this all messed up. And so then they start to say, oh, well, Jesus came here to liberate the poor. And so you should believe in Jesus. And this is what's going to happen here. And he's going to be with us as we topple the government. Yes, maybe he might. That's where it's going on. What happened in generations in South America and Central America, liberation theology. And this becomes our core of what we believe. But the son of man didn't come just to do those things. The son of man came to seek and to save the lost. And then when we get it, we start to get involved and engaged in some of these things that are going to make the world a better place. It's a byproduct. This is going to be an unexpected thing that happens here to Zacchaeus and the Pharisees who are not happy with what they see happening. Chapter 19, verse 1, it says this, he entered Jericho, Jesus was, and was passing through. Last week, Jesus was there. He was on the road to Jericho, and there was that blind beggar who was calling out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped, was interrupted, and healed that man. We studied that. It's on the road to Jericho. Jericho is not the final destination. Jerusalem is the destination. The last place Jesus will ever be before he is killed is Jerusalem. He's just miles away from there right now. <clears throat> he's on his way. He is in Jericho and something unexpected happens. He meets somebody who's in need, a man named Zacchaeus. Even before we get into the meat of our text today, let's consider this first thought here about salvation unexpected. In the everyday, salvation can happen at unexpected times. In the everyday, salvation can happen at unexpected times. He entered Jericho and was passing through. He's just passing through. It's a short verse. He is passing through. It's not the final place. It is just a pass through. He is just moving. See, Jerusalem is like the center of all religious life. The temple is there. It is the, the, the uh, metropolis, right? It is the metropolitan city. It is the main place. And as Jesus is on his way to that place where he is going to be accused and killed, tried, all of those things are going to happen to him there. It is a lot of places that he's just passing through. But as he's passing through, he's not in such a hurry to get to the place that he misses out on all these opportunities that are there. In the routine of his life, he happens to come across people who need a savior. Sometimes we're just passing through, right? Passing through in relationships. Think about your own work life. There's people that pass through by your office. They stop in your shop. They come to your restaurant and sit at your table. We have so many opportunities to meet people as they just pass through. But this is the beautiful thing about the Lord is that salvation happens at unexpected times, even when people are just passing through. It can happen in a moment. It's in an instant. And we see that here in our text. At work, you pass people in the elevator, in the cafeteria, you pass people on the way to a business meeting, to a luncheon. You're always passing around people as you're passing through. Think about your schools. Some of you are involved in schools, your parent-teacher associations, your um, school boards, your uh, classrooms that you're involved in, maybe a parent, a classroom parent. And as we do those things, we end up passing through and we meet all kinds of people in our neighborhoods. You walk your dog and you're just passing through and you're meeting people. You wave sometimes. They may not want to wave back, but you wave and you pass through. When you're doing yard work, we start to see all these people. And all around us in the regular daily life that we have, people are just passing through. Even though it's not the final destination, it is the destination where he is going to meet Zacchaeus who needs this. Salvation can happen in everyday life at unexpected times. Verse 2, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. Salvation is coming to this man. He doesn't know it yet. Let's consider this thought here about unexpected people. The broken, the broken. Salvation can happen to unexpected people. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. 
So he was a chief tax collector. He's got all these other tax collectors that are working, maybe working for him. He's the chief of all of them. And the tax collector, we've talked about this so many times already in our study of Luke, because Jesus interacts with these tax collectors. And a tax collector was taking from people money that was supposed to go to the government, and they would keep some for themselves. They were defrauding people. They were cheating. And so because they were cheating people, they ended up having a lot of money. So he was a tax collector and he was rich. He had more money and more hatred from the people, right? You can picture it. It's like Rome is occupying our sovereign state. We are the chosen people and Rome is here and you work for Rome. You're taking our money and giving the taxes to them. You're betraying your people. That's what they would have felt. And so they would have hated him and called him a sinner. But salvation is coming to Zacchaeus. It says he was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Last week, when we were talking about the rich ruler who Jesus said, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And the rich man went away dejected. And Jesus says, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Right? It's easier for this to happen, but he said, but it's possible. And so now we have an interaction with someone who it was possible for, a rich man who is going to get saved. And we're going to see his response here, the broken salvation can happen at un- to unexpected people. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. Because of Jesus' fame is spreading, he wants to find out who this person is, and he wanted to see him, but, but Zacchaeus was, that's one of the things we learned when we were little, right? You guys, who grew up in church in Sunday school? You guys know the song? Yeah. Sing it. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. That's all I remember. That's all we need to do. That's as far as we got in the text. Anyway, that's all we need to do right now. And so this is Zacchaeus. We just know this about him. He's not just a little man, but this version, he's a wee little man. He is short. And Jesus is passing through, and so he wants to see him. But if you have ever been at a place where people are taller than you, you know what it's like. All you see is the back of their heads. And so you want to get to a higher place. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. He ran on ahead. Here is this little man. I picture Danny DeVito for some reason. I picture Danny DeVito, and he is a rich little man who has an opportunity to see Jesus, and he can't, so he runs, which is so uncharacteristic of somebody like this. And he runs, and then he climbs up. He climbs up into a sycamore tree. And there he is, he's perched up there. And because he's littler, right, he's able to just scurry up there and he's smaller, right? And so he's there in the sycamore tree and he's watching as Jesus passes by. He's like, nobody will know I'm here. I'm just in the sycamore tree and he's just watching as Jesus passes by because he wants to see this person. Now, Jesus is a celebrity right now. Everybody wants to know Jesus. They want to see him in two chapters, we're going to see everything turns, the triumphal entry from there on. In just a couple weeks, we're going to get there after the Relate Conference. When we see this, they turn on Jesus, but right now he is a celebrity and they want to find him. They want to see him. They want to touch him so they can get healing. They want him to come and be with him, come to my house, visit. They love him. So there's a massive group of people. Think about any parade you've been to when a sports team has won a championship or when a war has ended, maybe you've seen videos of these things and there is a ticker tape parade and you see the the commotion that's happening as the floats make their way down and everybody's attention is on the people there. And here's the person holding the Stanley Cup up or the NBA trophy or whatever it might be. And there they are and everybody's looking at them. And maybe you've seen the pictures of the people hanging up to get a view and they're leaning off of those light poles The people that are on the parade, like Jesus, the celebrities, they don't really even notice it because everybody's there for me, but not Jesus, because Jesus, his mission is to come to seek to save the lost. So Jesus, nobody else notices Zacchaeus, I believe. They're all looking at Jesus. That's why the crowds are there. Here he is, the famous one. He's right here. Jesus himself isn't trying to be a celebrity. He just is. They're coming to him. They want to see him. And Jesus, he doesn't just take all of this. He stops and he looks up and sees 
the unnoticed one, the broken one. It's Zacchaeus. Salvation can happen to unexpected people. Zacchaeus, he had some things that were blocking him from seeing Jesus, didn't he? Very practical things. First thing that was blocking him was just very practical. It was his short stature. It was a physical impediment. But he also had something else that blocked him. He was hated. He was a tax collector. He had an emotional impediment. What are they going to think what are they going to think of me? They don't want me around. If I get up here to the front, you know, they're going to do something to me. And so he has these blockages. So he tries to find another way to see Jesus. And some of you feel the same way. You feel like there are some things that are in your life specifically, probably not the stature thing, but even for us, we sometimes have some things that block us from seeing Jesus And we want to talk a little about these things. Here's a few that I just wrote down. Things we use to block us from God. First thing here that we use to block us from God is our past actions. Our past actions. Maybe you feel like you've done wrong. You've hurt people. You've done the wrong thing. And you're like, there's no way that God would want to see me. Maybe you've ruined your marriage because of decisions you've made. Maybe your children don't want anything to do with you. And you're like, that. I am so far from God. And we think that our past can be a block from us seeing him. Our past actions, we use them to block us from God. Our past pains. So not just things we do, but the things that were done to us. Sometimes people hurt us. They betray us. They talk bad about us. They didn't include us, they fired us, they, whatever it could be. And we take our past pains and then we set up a barrier where I can't see him right now because I'm so discouraged because of what's going on, things that block us from God. And then third here, I think it happened with a rich ruler and also probably for Zacchaeus a bit, our possessions possessions, the things that we have that are in between us and God, sometimes we look at that and our possessions can be a block from us actually seeing God. That rich ruler, he worshiped his money. I'm sure Zacchaeus had a bit of that as well. And so that can be something that blocks us from seeing the Lord. And in the course of our everyday lives, these things that block us from seeing Jesus, so much of our brokenness that we have, the very thing that Jesus is going to use his limitations. It's going to be what he uses to reach him. Here's a way to phrase it. I wrote this down. What you see as a block to following Jesus could be what Jesus is using for you to see him clearly. The thing that you see as a block from you actually seeing Jesus could be the thing that Jesus is using so you can actually see him clearly. That's what's happening with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, he's hindered, and he goes up into a tree. The thing that's blocking him is now the source of so much joy. All those people would have loved for Jesus to say to them what he says to this outcast. The broken, the broken. Salvation comes to unexpected people. These are unexpected things. Let's continue in the text here. Verse 5 says, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, I want you to remember that, hurry. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Hurry, come down, stay today. All right, I want you to remember those words. Hurry, come down, stay today. Jesus has some urgency here. Jesus is inviting himself over now to Zacchaeus' house. He had no place planned to stay in Jericho. He can wait on getting to Jerusalem just a little bit, and so he's there needing a place to stay. So the third thought here, the ordinary salvation can happen during unexpected opportunities, during just ordinary opportunities. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. Hurry, come down, must stay today. Jesus wasn't too busy to notice Zacchaeus up in that tree and he calls him by name. What would Zacchaeus have felt when he heard the Savior say his name. All those other people, they hate him in Jericho. They're like, say my name, say my name. And he's like, I'm not saying your name. I'm going to say the one you despise his name. And he says his name. See, some of you think your sin is putting you too far away from the Lord. And yet he knows your name. He knows all your names. And he wants to speak your name. He wants to say your name in this way, just like he does for Zacchaeus. He's not expecting this. Zacchaeus, it's unexpected how does he know my name? 
I never met him before. I've never been to Nazareth. He's not been through these streets before here in Jericho. How does he know my name? I'm sure he's thinking all these things. Verse 6, so he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Zacchaeus wasn't offended by being asked at the last minute to come to his house to make a meal. See, broken people are often in better places to receive the love of somebody because they've been broken, because they're hurting. And Jesus is offering Zacchaeus this opportunity. Now, I'm not talking about people who are broken and don't want any help. There's a lot of people like that. Zacchaeus clearly wants some help. Zacchaeus clearly wants some kind of an interaction with Jesus. That's why he's in the place here. And Jesus, he enters his world and Zacchaeus accepts it. Verse 7, and when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. As I was reading this, I was trying to figure out who the they is. That's what I do when I'm studying. I just write questions and I'm like, who is they? Who is the they? And so, you know, I think the they, this is again, I, I can't say for sure, but I think the they is the Pharisees for sure, the religious leaders, because we've been seeing that kind of theme go on. But also the they, it could be the disciples, you know, just like they rebuked the parents for bringing the children. A few weeks ago, we studied about that. So the they could be everybody. Listen, why not come to my house? Why not? Why are you going to his house? Hey, Jesus, why are you going to his house? Let's go to this guy's house. He's got a better home. Whatever it could be, they are all grumbling because of what they are seeing here. It's unexpected opportunities that Jesus is using here. When Jesus was passing through Jericho, he didn't just pass through with blinders on as so many of us do. He passed through with eyes open to see. And he was open to opportunities that were present right there for him. And here, this person, Zacchaeus, who's in need, seeking Jesus, but actually Jesus is maybe seeking him. And so when we're going about our life, let's have eyes open to see. When you're in small group, maybe eyes open to see and to have discernment about what people are saying, what they're feeling. When you're serving, have eyes open to have discernment to try to understand what it is that people are facing that you're serving with. In relationships, have eyes open to have discernment to understand what is it that they're feeling right now. And this is what Jesus does so beautifully. And as we want to be more and more like Jesus, then we should be these kinds of people as well, looking in these ways with eyes open. Jesus seeks out these opportunities. He mentions them by name. He is looking for these opportunities. Now, he talks about all these things with urgency. That's why I wanted you to have those words that he says here, right? He says this again, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down. I must stay at your house today. Hurry, come down, must stay today. Hurry, come down, must stay today. Jesus is making a point here with Zacchaeus that today, right now, is the time. So hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry. Now, when we use the word hurry up, we often use it in a negative way. Hurry up with my oil change. Hurry up. It's taking so long for you to answer the customer service call. Hurry up and brush your teeth. Hurry up and put your clothes down. Hurry up and finish your peas. Hurry up, right? You can see what I'm saying. Sometimes we are in a hurry because we're just impatient with people, but Jesus isn't impatient. Jesus knows the heart of people. And so hurry. I must stay today. Calm down. Hurry. Calm down. I must stay today. Jesus wants him to understand that there's an urgency to it. He isn't asking Zacchaeus to hurry up because he's late for something. He's doing it because he wants Zacchaeus to know that today is the day. I must stay, he says, must. Now, there are a few musts that Jesus have mentioned in the word of God. In John chapter 4, verse 4, it says... Uh, he must pass through Samaria. And then as he's passing through Samaria, the disciples, they go and he sits at a well. The disciples go to get some food. And then he talks to the Samaritan woman 
And she goes on to be a witness to her community. And so he must pass through Samaria, he says in John 4. As we were studying in the Gospel of Luke, he says, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer these things. That's what he says. I must do that. And here Jesus is saying this, I must stay. There's not a lot of must, but he must stay. I am compelled to do this. I am going to do this, Zacchaeus. I'm going to be here with you tonight. All these moments that we have in our life where we're compelled to take action. The reason why he says, come down, hurry, must stay today. Come down, hurry, must stay today. Come down, hurry, must stay today is because tomorrow you're going to forget. That's the way it is, isn't it? Today is the day. Today is the time for response. Tomorrow might come, but today is a certainty. In your heart, you know you want to respond today when you're convicted because tomorrow is just a possibility. It might happen. Tomorrow is just a dream. Tomorrow is a future plan, but today is a certainty. Right now, I've got a pulse. Right now, I've got an action. See, Jesus knows that if we put off till tomorrow what I could do today, we might not even do it tomorrow. You guys know what I'm talking about. We have a funny saying in our house. Pastor Ricky came and spoke here a while ago in the summer. I hope he'll have him back too, and a real good friend of mine. And when he was living here, we'd always say this thing. We'd be eating, you know, we'd be, be over at our house on Sunday evening, had dinner. We'd always say this. She, my daughter, she knows what I'm saying. What am I going to say? Die starts Monday. Die starts Monday. It's like, today we're going to eat. Die starts Monday. Pastor John and I were talking and we're like, yeah, you know, new year. It's like, you know, it's it. And we were just, die, start, die starts in January. Then January came and, and uh, John is like, January 31st is still January. You know, this is like the way we are, right? We put off, but Jesus wants us to understand that when you are compelled by God, do it now. Today, come down, hurry, must stay today. Come down, hurry, must stay today. Like he sounds like Yoda. I left out some of the words. Hurry, come down, must stay today. Jesus has an urgency about it because today is the acceptable day. Today is a day of salvation. And so he wants this urgency. And what about us? As we look around, as we think about things, don't leave undone the things that you can do today. Go and reconcile today. Don't leave it till tomorrow because tomorrow you're going to say tomorrow (laughs) or next day. Jesus says, hurry, come down, must stay. Today is the day. Now, not everyone we meet is ready to meet Jesus, to hear about Jesus And so be cordial and friendly in your neighborhoods, you know, like be friendly, just be open and opportunities might come. Opportunities for you to to love and to share and people in need. And they'll be like Zacchaeus looking and searching and here you have an answer that you can share with them. Look at how they treat Zacchaeus, right? He is a broken person and they despise him. He's probably very rich in finances, but poor in friends, an abundance of possessions, but lacking true wealth. As I was studying, here's a few things that I thought that people use to block their own opportunity with other people. We talked about how sometimes we do things to block our view from God, but sometimes we do some things to block my own opportunity with people. Here's the first thing. They don't think like me. They don't think like me. He's a Democrat. She's a Republican. He's a Buddhist. She's a Muslim. They're so strict with their kids. Oh my gosh, they're so liberal with their kids. They don't do anything. They don't think like me. And if they don't think like me, then sometimes I just block it. I can't see them. I can't see them for who they are. I can't see their heart. If Jesus, then just think about Jesus everywhere he went. Nobody thought like him. This man that's up in the sycamore tree, he for sure doesn't think like him, but he sees him because he doesn't let a person's life and what they think block him from seeing a person in need. They don't think like me. They don't look like me. Their ethnicity, they got tattoos, their, the way they, their hair is made, the way that they dress. Right? Have you ever seen someone and just made a judgment about them without even talking to them? Yeah, everybody, you should be nodding your head. We all do it. That's like, we all do it. I'm preaching here and I do it too. We make a judgment about people because we see them, because we've had an experience. Maybe we've just heard of other people's experiences. And so we will treat a person in a different way because they don't look like me. Because if you don't look like me, then it's uncertainty here. And I go to my stereotypes. 
I go to my preconceived notions of what you are like, and then I might end up treating you poorly. They don't dress like me, right? They, I'm uncomfortable with you. Why are they dressed in black all the time? I don't get it. You know, like we have all these things and we start to put these on other people. It goes both ways. You know, sometimes maybe you're a person who dresses cool and other people like they're in their suits, man. Like, gosh, it's so, and they're in their suits. They're looking at you and like back and forth. Everybody's just being blocked because you don't look like me. Many years ago, you know, after 9-11, it was hard to travel for people to look like me. You know, just hard, just to be honest. You know, was, uh, we'd go to the airport and it was like, I, every, they always want to look at my bags. It's okay. I understood. I wasn't bothered by it. Oh, there's some profiling going on. I understand. I saw Time Magazine. I saw all those pictures. I, I get it. I get it. I wasn't bothered. I was fine. You do your job, sir. No problem. All right. So we're on a plane from Toronto. Coming back. I was the one up there for a funeral or something. I'm flying back. It was me and two other brown people. Indians, we were standing there waiting like our bags we just gotten out. And one of the guys, a younger guy, much younger than me, probably 20 years younger than me, he's wearing a hockey jersey. And uh, he says to me, he goes, did you get searched? And I said, yeah, I got searched. And he goes, I got searched too. He, and then the other guy goes, yeah, I got searched also. And so we were kind of laughing. A bit. He goes, he goes, I even wore a hockey jersey. <laughs> He goes, I don't know the first thing about hockey. He goes, people like us, we don't play hockey. There's no ice in India. He goes, I wore something that is going to be like what white people like. Right? Remember, we were laughing there. and You don't look like me. Because you don't look like me, there's a danger here. I'm going to block myself from an opportunity. But man, what a beautiful thing that we have right here going on because there's a lot of people who don't look like me and we could reach out. We could get into a community group. We can go out to dinner. We could learn about another culture. We could, there's so many things that we can do right here to start to be a little bit more open because there's all these broken people that are hanging out in trees. (laughs) And if we had eyes to see, we would be able to be a blessing. But so often because they don't look like me. I can't see them. They don't think like me. They don't look like me. They don't act like me. Their lifestyle. They're gay. They drink alcohol. They don't come to church. I think he was in jail. They don't act like me. Maybe you've got a list of things of people that don't act like you, and so it's like, I can't see. I can't see. And yet there's broken people up in sycamore trees who are looking for Jesus, and here we are, but I can't see you. They don't act like me. Maybe you have a list. Maybe you need to repent of your list. You don't have to agree with everything that everybody's doing to see them. And so maybe we can be these kinds of people. Uh, Pastor Jason gave us a charge. We do a little time before the service to pray and just talk about the service that happens at 8.30 uh, before both of these services. And uh, he reminded us of uh, the fact that the church in Thessalonica was known for their faith and love. And he's like, so often, you know, you're meeting other pastors. They're like, how big is your church? He says, nobody's ever asked him, tell me about the way your church loves. or Tell me about the way your church has faith. Tell me about the way your church is suffering. And it was just really cool to hear that and to think about that, that we are trying to be a place where people really love, where we really love even people who don't act like me, who don't think like me, who don't look like me. And it's so sad when those of us that know the Lord, we're so hard to get over these barriers. And so we are trying to do that. And so if you're a follower of Christ here and you're a person who has these barriers, pray that God would remove those. And look at the great experiment that we have here of City Line Bible Church as a place and an opportunity to start to try some of those things and reach out and And if you're a broken person here, recognizing that your life is not in order, and you're like, I've been up in that tree, and I'm looking for Jesus, I want you to know that he is looking for you. And I hope you can be found, because we're lost, and the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. That is the mission of Jesus. Jesus takes advantage of every ordinary opportunity at night, at the home of a tax collector, Not just dinner, but staying over. The text continues, verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. 
Zacchaeus has turned. He's repentant. Finally, let's consider this about what the receiving of salvation does for a person. The repentant. When salvation happens, we do unexpected things. The repentant. When salvation happens, we do unexpected things. At the end of the service uh, earlier today, at the 9 o'clock service, somebody came and said, you know, hey, I, I got a, a better phrase. I think this might fit a little better. And I was like, tell me. Tell me what it is. And she said it like this. And I, I was like, I think it is better. So you can scratch out if you want. You can keep it. It doesn't matter. This isn't the word of God. These are just ways for us to try to understand the text. So she said, the repentant, when salvation happens, we make unexpected decisions. I don't know. That's pretty good. You'll see what I mean. When salvation happens, we make unexpected decisions or we do unexpected things. Your choice. <laughs> Choose your own adventure. Verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. All that's happened between Zacchaeus and Jesus isn't recorded. We don't know every discussion. We don't know, we don't know what was for dinner. We don't know anything that's happened. All we know is that he has a transformation. Zacchaeus has received the Lord and he turns and he starts to make these unexpected decisions or do these unexpected things. See, he's repentant. He turns around. I've illustrated this here so many times. I was going this way and I realized that there was a savior who was calling me who died and I looked to him in the cross. I repented, metanoia. I turned, I repented, I confessed. And as I confessed Christ, I ended up receiving this gift of salvation. And I've been saved. The repentant, when salvation happens, we make unexpected decisions. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. He also is a son of Abraham. The people of Israel, they thought this guy was a tax collector, a sinner, the worst of the worst. He is out there. And Jesus says, no, he is a son of Abraham also. He wasn't righteous, but Jesus says he also is a son of Abraham. Abraham, of course, Father Abraham, the one whose descendants would number the, uh, like sand on the shore, like stars in the sky. And we know the people of Israel, Jacob, his Israel, the nation Israel, it's Jacob's name. He wrestled with God, Israel. And so Abraham... Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's grandfather, Israel's grandfather, Abraham, he's a son of Abraham. He's a chosen one. He is part of the family, just like the Pharisees, just like the elders, just like the chief priests, like all the religious people. He also is a son. Verse 10, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. The son of man came to seek and save the lost. In verse 7, we see what the people have done, they've come to scorn, to scorn the lost, to shun them. That's what they have done. But Jesus, the Son of Man, has come to seek and save the lost. Ezekiel chapter 34, the prophet, he hears this word from God. The prophet Ezekiel, oh, just interesting guy, a lot of crazy things about Ezekiel, but Ezekiel was his prophet and he heard from the Lord. And as he heard from God, this is what he says in verse six, Ezekiel 34, verse six, my sheep were scattered. He's speaking on behalf of God. It's almost like this. Thus says the Lord, my sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth. They're lost with none to search or seek for them. The shepherds of Israel, there's all these people that are scattered and lost, and nobody is looking for them, thus says the Lord. The shepherds of Israel are supposed to be seeking for them. They're supposed to be looking for them. Verse 11 continues, Ezekiel 34, 11, for thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. This is a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy that Jesus has come to seek and save the lost. And if there were any Bible scholars there at the time, any people who really know the, knew the prophets, they would have recognized when Jesus says, the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. He is saying he is God. Jesus has come to do this because the shepherds that were there weren't doing what they were supposed to do. And so the, the shepherd, the chief shepherd, is going to come and do it. Salvation is offered to Zacchaeus, and it happens on this day. It happens in a moment. It happens 
in a period of time. It's not tomorrow. It's not next week. It doesn't take years or months or weeks. It it's now. Today is the acceptable day. There's an urgency. Come down. Hurry. Must stay. Today. Salvation comes this day. Today, he says, salvation has come to this house. It's today. Zacchaeus, he didn't have a lot of time to think about what he was going to do. And so he just says, I'll give half of what I have to the poor. Remember last week, the rich ruler, he was told by Jesus, one thing you lack, sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Zacchaeus on his own says, I'm going to give half of what I have. And Jesus is like, that's great. Right? So it's not about how much you give. It's not about that. It's about being obedient to the Lord. And when this righteous, self-righteous, rich ruler said, I've done all that I have. Jesus gives him one more thing to do. And that one more thing to do was too hard. He leaves dejected. But now Zacchaeus in his own right, he recognizes that he has done wrong. And so he says, I'm going to give half of everything I have to the poor. And I'm going to give fourfold to anybody I cheated. I took one from you when I was I took four from you and I was only supposed to take one. That's three. I'm going to give you 12, four times three, because I've cheated you. He must have had a lot of resources. When salvation comes, we make unexpected decisions, don't we? We do radical things. We're just transformed. We're different people. Zacchaeus is overwhelmed by grace. And in his being overwhelmed by grace, he then gives of grace other people. It's the way of the cross. It's the way of followers of Christ. So has anything changed for you after you've come to faith in Christ? Have you made any very difficult decisions? Have you done some unexpected things trying to make things right? If you have, then you're on the right path. You're doing the right things. I accepted Jesus 30 years ago. It's so hard to believe I've been following the Lord that long, 30 years. And everything changed for me. I was a, I'm a different person. And and sometimes I do the wrong thing and I go back and I ask for forgiveness to do the right things. But when salvation comes, when it happens, we do these unexpected things. See, Zacchaeus, this is what I want to close with here. Zacchaeus, he thinks that he's going up into a tree to see Jesus. Jesus is walking on the road to see Zacchaeus. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus is on the lookout. He is looking. He is seeking. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. That's what John chapter 15 says. Jesus chose you. Jesus picked you. Jesus came for you. The son of man is seeking to save that which is lost. Are there any of you here who are just lost, wandering? Maybe you're lost. You've confessed Jesus, but you're just lost. You're struggling. I've talked to some people here in the church this week who are just, I don't know, I just feel spiritually dead right now. Maybe you're feeling a little bit of that. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. And he keeps on seeking. He doesn't keep on saving you, but he'll keep on seeking after you. And maybe the Lord is coming for you. Let's uh, close here with an opportunity now to respond, and let's pray. We're going to have communion in a moment, but uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather here to worship, and I, I pray, Lord, that you would um, just continue to speak to our hearts. Maybe there's some here today who must uh, come to faith in Christ, who have yet to believe that they can be forgiven, who've yet to confess Jesus as Lord. Maybe you'll do that work uh, here today. And we thank you for this opportunity that we can remember your son, Jesus, through these elements that we have in our hands now. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.